So, uh, repeating, uh, repeating again. Uh, my name is Sergi Castella. I'm joining uh, from di- in, in live from Lab Forty Two in a pretty rainy day on an otherwise very sunny week in Amsterdam. So, live from from Science Park. Um, uh, the usuals might notice that actually Jakub is is not here, couldn't be joining uh, today. So today is going to be a bit of a special show because it's going to be just me. So I'm going to be pretty much talking for one hour. Um, so buckle up for that. Um, but uh, Jakub, along with uh, a bunch of team members from Zeta Alpha, have been at ECIR um, this week in Dublin. So they couldn't make it uh, today. Um, so yeah, you'll have to, you have to just uh, deal with that. That said, um, shall we just start? I see people came in already, but, uh, yeah, I, I guess if someone is, is, is missing, um, uh, they just have to join, join a bit later. So welcome everyone. Uh, this month in Trends in AI, April, I guess, uh, let's, let's, let's start with, of course, um, you know, this month GPT-4 has, has been the start of the show, um, but... Um, yeah, but but I, I, I we're gonna we're gonna certainly talk about that about later. But I wanted to uh, start talking about a bunch of news. Um, the first one I think that most people might be familiar with is this is giant uh, open letter that a bunch of very high profile figures in the world of AI and and related technology uh, world have signed, which is this open letter to pause uh, AI experiments, which is a a call basically to say. Um, let's sh- let's everyone everyone who's training models that are par- more powerful than GPT-4 uh, pause the experiments for six months because it's too um, you know there's too much risk involved in the deployment of this system. And it's been very interesting because um, a lot of the people like Stuart Russell, Gary Marcus, uh, Benjio, Max Sekmark, even Elon Musk as well. Um, a lot of people. Uh, signed this letter for different reasons. Some were kind of more of this AGI type of of existential risk type of people. Um, other people were more on the camp of like uh, being very worried about societal damage uh, caused by these. Um, a lot of critiques have been also mentioned. I personally would say it's it hasn't it it didn't seem like a very uh, actionable type of. Of proposal, um, especially because if, if any and if anyone any company took this seriously, that meant and you you have this, this sort of like global coordination problem where where someone is ahead if they if they don't um, comply with the, the stopping of the experiments. And a lot of people have uh, kind of been criticizing this open letter for being too much of a of an overreaction, right? And I think that's very it's it's been kind of uh, interesting to see how this has triggered uh, this kind of massive sort of AGI existentialist type of discourse happening, uh, especially championed by Alexei Yudkovsky. I don't know if you know know this guy. He's he's, he's kind of a a well known theorist and like a personality in the whole space of AGI theory. Um, and he's basically like ringing all the alarm bells, like we're all gonna die type of thing, uh, Terminator, ter- Terminator style, uh, super intelligence explosion. Um, and it's it's been uh, a lot of a lot of other kind of researchers in AI have have been trying to sort of combat this this discourse. Um, personally, think it's um, yeah. I, I personally don't don't completely like don't really subscribe to this. Uh, um, doomsday scenario terminator style of of singularity explosion uh, of, of like kind of runaway exponential progress with artificial intelligence um, I would refer um, to read I actually think oh yeah I, I, I have in the, in, the, in the previous slide um, uh, one of the biggest personalities uh, has been Jan Lecun. he these days he spends a lot of time on Twitter I wonder uh, if if that if that's that's to his detriment. Um, but uh, but yeah, he's been like finding this, and um, I think that uh, a couple of other resources that I found very interesting on the topic has been uh, Benjios uh, has had an open letter on why he signed this, uh, you know, th- this open letter. Um, I think it's very interesting because it kind of like comes to show that a lot of people who signed that letter come from very different places, and he's very worried about the sort of societal impact of what happens when you have machines that kind of Im- can impersonate humans, and 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 suddenly there's there's like all sorts of agents online that that uh, can pretend to be humans, but they're not, um, and the societal and informational implications of that. Personally, I think I, I'm not too worried about the the kind of informational hazards uh, coming from language models. 
Um, and the reason for that is, uh, my, in my impression, like the bottleneck to misinformation has not been the production of misinformation, but more like the distribution of, of, of misinformation. And that has been a problem, uh, you know, in, in the last decade. Uh, and like social media has made that, that abundantly, abundantly clear. Um, and I don't uh, clearly see how, how, how much better, uh, uh, like how much, how much more misinformation you can have, as in, uh, there's not a shortage of shortage of, of fake news already out there. There's enough people to produce these fake news. Uh, the biggest problem is is, is distributing them, um, or like the, the the kind of biggest barrier to 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 having a, a lot of societal impact. Uh, and I think that that's already been there. So so personally, don't subscribe that much to that. I mean, I, I do certainly agree that you know there should be a lot of uh, like thoughtful. Uh, and thought should be put there before deploying all these systems. And there's a very dangerous now moment where a lot of these companies are kind of racing to be first to deploy things. Uh, certainly that's gonna cause a lot of problems. Um, I think certainly companies are gonna put these, these, these models in places that they should not be put and they're gonna make decisions and gonna have consequences that are that are bad for society, uh, and then regulation is going to come in, and there's going to be this 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 dance. Uh, but personally, I think that it, it's going to be pretty pretty similar to other technologies, um, and I don't buy into the this sort of like mysticism of of the word intelligence. And um, I think that there's this piece um, by uh, I, I forgot uh, now now his name, a uh, professor um, is Elden Ring, an existential risk to humanity, in which he sort of uh, Tackles the issue of AGI explosion, and and I think that this this little snippet summarizes very well something that I subscribe a lot, which is I believe that intelligence is rather an arbitrary collection of capabilities that have some very predictive com uh, predictive value for humans, but is is a concept that is largely meaningless outside of of this narrow context. So you cannot sort of like make make these sort of grand assumptions based on intelligence being some sort of like scalar uh, property that, that sort of just uh, can scale magically uh, and, and explode. Um, and, and, and yeah, but I don't know, let, let, let us know what, what, what you guys think, uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that has been like a big part of the discourse that's been kind of like fun to observe um, uh, in, in this past month. Um, on the hardware side, uh, there was the NVIDIA uh, developer conference and a couple of things that they announced were, was this, um, uh, finally, this uh, NVIDIA Cloud DGX. Uh, basically, they're bringing the H100s um, finally in principle to, to, to their cloud uh, services. Um, I don't. I don't know actually what, what exact date is for there, but um, basically, yeah. The the in terms of memory, um, you have these uh, clusters that are I think I've written here up to eight. Uh, yeah, eight eight H one hundreds, which totals uh, sixty uh, um, six hundred forty gigabytes of of VRAM. Um, per per each of these nodes that acts like a big massive computer. Um, but the most important part that I wanted to mention uh, was these uh, Nvidia foundations. They announced that they want to become some sort of they said like TSMC for foundation models. And the idea is that a lot of companies are going to want to build foundation models, large generalist models, um, with their data. Uh, but uh, training these models is really hard. So what they're gonna what they say they're gonna do is uh, have this sort of uh, it have, like they drew the analogy with the with the chip manufacturing world where companies design design chips and then there's TSMC that that uh, has the expertise to to build them and all the like lithography and all, all those things that are very hard to to do right so Nvidia wants to become like that TSMC for the world of foundation models and I think it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out it, if it if it's a business that that sort of a lot of companies buy in I think it's going to be interesting also from the perspective of uh, data privacy because a lot of well not 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 so not so much privacy but like sensitive information how how much companies trust Nvidia to keep uh, sensitive information like pri private uh, intellectual property uh, safe. Um, and yeah, so but but that, in my opinion, was a very very interesting announcement. And we also got a, this paper from Google just a couple of days ago, outlining more in detail their um, their V4 TPUs, which were announced almost a year ago, I think. Um, 
And uh, yeah, the, their main one of their main kind of like headline features is these. They they feature these this optical interconnect that makes uh, makes uh, like kind of like the computing topology uh, kind of adjusting uh, like adjusting computation to route through different accelerators uh, much faster apparently. Um, but yeah, but they I, I mean Google has still been struggling a lot to have like the masses adopt TPUs and, and Nvidia still has such a such a big lead in, in that space. So so we'll see how much their that like that performance improvement actually matters when it comes to real world. Um, yeah, and now when it comes to OpenAI news, of course, um, the two main headlines were GPT-4. Uh, we're gonna talk later about the paper and this evaluation paper also uh, that, that was very interesting. I mean it's interesting because we have so little information about GPT-4 that uh, it's hard to it's hard to talk about it. It certainly has made this transition from something that uh, OpenAI was publishing as research. Uh, GPT-3 already uh, they didn't share that much initially, um, as in like they didn't open source the model or or anything. Um, like and and it's been kind of like increasingly closed source. Uh, and now for GPT four, it was pretty much just a product launch, right? It was really not nothing, not not much to do with with research, uh, which is fair, you know. Um, I guess they they also want to monetize this uh, this API, and now it's a it's a competitive advantage to keep it to keep it secret. Um, but also uh, maybe an even more interesting. Um, release they made well release announcement uh, because uh, it's still behind the closed beta. Um, it was a ChatGPT plugins which is uh, basically allows ChatGPT to interact with a whole bunch of um, augmented like tools uh, like Wolfram Up or like like basically it's in this whole space that we discussed earlier about augmented language models. Uh, the idea is that ChatGPT can now interact with a whole bunch of like a retrieval engine or a computation engine like Wolfram Alpha or like a, a searcher for flights or something like that. And it can answer questions now about, you know, find me flights for this and uh, or that. Um, and I think that that's very interesting. It's something that kind of we've been saying that is a direction that the, the that would be very fruitful for language models because they're so good at being sort of this, this sort of Generic interface between modules, so you have like you have very modular architectures that that talk to each other with with large language models because they're so flexible and so so powerful. Um, still, I haven't been able to try it to be honest um, uh, because it's still behind a closed beta. So um, that's a, that's a bit sad, but I think it's very interesting that OpenAI uh, is now doing this. Right? Uh, it seems like. When 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 these plugins can include retrieval stuff, they it, they start to at some level compete with with um, um, with Bing, for instance, uh, with Microsoft, their partners. So I think it's gonna be interesting to see what kind of like the Microsoft and and OpenAI sort of business models, how how much they clash, and and whether that collaboration is gonna be like um, long living one. Um, and finally. Uh, something that has been in the news also this past week has been the that the fact that Italy banned ChatGPT um, until uh, until they figure out how much of GPT training uh, violated the GDPR laws, and I think that's uh, super interesting from the perspective of regulation in Europe, uh, because in principle the data regulation for Italy is the same as the, in the whole EU, with, which is GDPR. Um, and now there's a bit of nervousness on like, oh, what, what's that gonna mean for the rest of EU countries? Is it is it, is it gonna be that um, open AI models are not accessible in Europe, which would be uh, which would be a huge hit, uh, but at the same time, you also want to add some some sort of like uh, regulatory pressure so that um, these companies uh, cannot do anything with with the training of their model. Um, I'm not sure like to what extent uh, like what is the specific like the more specific claim that they're making in terms of violating GDPR law, but it's gonna be. Um, uh, very interesting to see how how this um, evolves in the in the next few years. Like for sure, only one country is not that big of news, but I would expect that if the whole EU now bans access to uh, ChatGPT and other OpenAI models, that's gonna be um, that's gonna be huge, and uh, there's gonna be suddenly a lot of um, a lot of incentives to improve the or like have some sort of new regulation or like new tree new 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 uh, deal to. To um, to make these models available in some in some way, or maybe OpenAI is going to have to train new ones with that 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 uh, regulate um, that um, are 
uh, in accordance with, with GDPR. Uh, and finally, just wanted to add here that BART, I've heard a lot of news, but BART is still not... Um, um, I see. I see an attendee who um, makes a makes a point that this is, might be very good for for VPNs, <laughs> VPN companies, which is a, an excellent point. Um, if 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 ChatGPT is banned in uh, in Europe, um, but also also Bard is is probably pretty good for VPN companies because it's it's. Um, it's not available. It's still, I think, in only UK and US. So in the EU, it's sufficiently not available. Of course, you can uh, try to get on the whaling list by going into a, into a VPN. Um, but uh, but yeah. Um, all right. Moving on to some news from Meta. I think this was from literally yesterday. Um, they introduced this new uh, foundation model for uh, open, pretty much like a generic model for segmentation. Uh, it has been pretty good. I haven't had that much time to look uh, more deeply into it, and it wasn't featured in the blog that I published yesterday uh, because it, it, it's a recent. Um, but basically, they've trained this open, uh, they call it a segment anything model, um, which allows for basically a, a sort of prompting interaction with the segmentation model, which you say, I want to segment this, and then it, it returns a mask for like segmenting this fish or, or something. And the way that they've trained it, they've one of the biggest advancements is that they've collected uh, the biggest uh, in class like collection of masks for uh, segmentation masks for for dresses, which is in the order of I think it says here, eleven billion images, but one billion billion uh, masks because there's a lot of for a lot of photos there's uh, dozens or even hundreds of masks like you see here like with with the penguins for instance, um, and they're open sourcing everything in the usual meta way. Uh, which is which is really really cool. Um, I haven't seen enough evaluation to see how much of a how much of a PR um, uh, kind of power there is here versus how my how transformative this is gonna be. But I think this just highlights the same the same uh, sort of trend that we've seen of. Um, all, like in 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 the near future. The best performing models are always gonna be some sort of generic model that is then fine tuned or like more f yeah fine tuned for for your specific uh, um, um, tasks. But I think that um, yeah, it, it it just it just how it's like the 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 scaling nature of of machine learning is kind of in, unavoidable. Uh, the larger, the better. The more data, the more parameters. So this means that only a bunch of companies get to get to train these really powerful base generic models that are really good at many things. And then uh, to just go the last mile, you can you, you're gonna be able to probably fine tune this. Um, but um, yeah. Um, and then the other one that was I think a week old was also from Meta uh, was this adaptive skill coordination from robotic. Uh, mobile manipulation, which was this work from Meta that looked into um, having robots uh, perform tasks in the real world only from um, only from um, examples, which is a, a really cool advancement in the sort of in this domain of transferring experiments from simulation into the real world when when a robot has to perform tasks in the real world, which is a notoriously notoriously um, hard thing to do. Like it's very hard to have. Simulations that are so faithful that then can be transferred in the real world um, easily. Um, then continuing with some news uh, when it comes to um, generative modeling of images, uh, I think Mid Journey is probably uh, the biggest, um, you know, sort of uh, like the thing that's been uh, a lot on a, on on a lot of people's uh, minds in, and has been very successful at. Uh, you know, capturing the, the imagination of people. Uh, they released, well, they released, they made uh, their uh, V5 um, image text to image generation model available, and it's been all over Twitter. Uh, and I think one very interesting uh, kind of fact that, well, the thing that has happened here, you can see a tweet here from, from Jim Fan, um, where he compares the image generation model from um, Adobe and the one from Midjourney, and you see that it's kind of almost like very, uh, almost uh, funny, very funny how um, how better, how much better the Midjourney uh, model is compared to the Adobe Firefly. And 
you know, like it's probably uh, some people have speculated that this is because Adobe has to be way more careful which with what kind of data they use for training because they're a big company and they, they don't want to be exposed to some massive, uh, you know, scandal where they train a lot of copyrighted data and they didn't pay for it. Uh, whereas Midjourney is just, you know, like literally a dozen researchers, I think, that have bootstrapped these models from stable diffusion, like have had some very good, uh, you know, um, um, packaging of these models and fine tuning of these models so that they're very aligned and that they, they are very good, easy to use. Um, and it's so interesting how a team of small people uh, manages to do something so cool. Um, and I think it brings a lot of hope in the sense of, of uh, you know, OpenAI is not going to have a, uh, a monopoly and a lot of companies are going to have to compete with these models, which is, uh, you know, uh, great in the, in, the longer, in the longer run, I think. So I, I wanted to highlight that. Um, you see DALI 2 uh, hasn't been updated since then. And it's, it's not so much, you know, I, I feel like it's less, less of a, a, a synonym with text to image generation as it used to be. Uh, and then finally, we have this Runaway Gen 2, uh, the next step for generative AI. It's a, it's a text to video model. I, we've talked about this before. Um, and we still haven't been able to to try it, but they they had a more of a um, kind of public announcement this this past month. Um, it's going to be super interesting to see. Um, yeah, video generation is still is still kind of a, almost a, uh, unfair to call it video or, or misleading to call it video generation because these models generate um, more of a kind of GIF like moving images, like more like moving images rather than video. Um, so so yeah, I think that the, the, the video kind of label there it should come with, with some um, some caveat. Uh, the most interesting applications for text to video that I've seen are probably when it comes to style transfer of video, where, like, where you have a, a source video and then some kind of type and then you can style it. And I think that has a lot of really cool um, sort of artistic or like video production applications. When it comes to raw text or video, everything I've seen is is not is not so impressive or like not so useful. Uh, so we have another question on the chat. Uh, you think OpenAI will be a monopoly with um, all the open source LLMs? I think that um, for now, OpenAI seems to be quite quite ahead in terms of l large language models. Um, the ones that I've seen, only Anthropic comes close, um, but probably not so much with GPT-4, because GPT-4, um, and and um, it doesn't seem like there should be this massive uh, technological mode for them, because you know the, the techniques are largely known, um, the data is largely known. I, it, it seems like the the key differences are probably in the details of how the RLHF is done or like how how they you know manage to train really large models in a very stable way and and it seems like the open source type of projects have not been able to to capture that um, and yeah and I think that people who are succeeding at becoming leaders in this space are uh, it seems like OpenAI, it's, it seems like very much like a product focused company where it approaches research as a sort of, as really wants to have a deliverable that is very well packaged and, and, and is, is basically a product. Whereas you see a lot of the work, uh, research work from Google, uh, it's less, less of a product, way more research focused. Um, and it's not so much like, uh, it, it's more like, oh, we do a bunch of experiments and then we share our findings, whereas with OpenAI, it's like, we're going to build this really cool thing and have really good insights. Um, uh, so to go to, back to, to the question about the monopoly, um, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think they're going to have a monopoly, but uh, they might be the best, the best uh, LLM provider for, for a good while. Um, but yeah, I think that these examples from text to image generation are, uh, are sort of like hopeful in terms of avoiding or preventing um, an open AI monopoly. Um, yeah, and uh, speaking about uh, um, large language models and, and open source based language models, there's been this month, you know, since uh, Yama was uh, published, uh, I think around a month ago by Meta, there's been a bunch of people who have fine-tuned that into some using GPT 
so sorry, let, let me recap. Um, the just for for every, for for context, uh, these Yama models published by by Meta were just this family of pre-trained language models. I think up to sixty billion, around sixty billion parameters or seventy-five. But now I'm, uh, that's the detail is not in my head. Um, but uh, yeah, but they were not RLA chapter and they were not aligned to follow instructions. So there's been, uh, you know, the, the first one and famous one was Alpaca, strongly uh, replicable instruction following model. Uh, and then there's been like Yam Adapter, there's this Vicuna 13 billion, uh, which are open source models that have been uh, instruction tuner in some way. Well, basically, what they've, like most of these uh, people have done is. Uh, Sort of distill OpenAI's models into these models by copying its output, um, which is has very interesting sort of. Um, it's interesting because if you go to the open source communities, it does seem like uh, this is a cherished uh, type of thing. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it it's kind of blurry, like crossing some some lines in terms of of fair usage of OpenAI's. Uh, models. It's unclear to me how how far you can get with this approach. As in, Alpaca, you know, claimed to be very strong, but they didn't really do a comprehensive evaluation. And 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 from what I've seen in interactions, it's not that strong compared to ChatGPT. So so all of these knockoffs still look like not comparable to the original. Um, but you know, it's gonna be it's. It's interesting because you can probably quite uh, well. Another interesting fact is, it seems like you don't need that much data, right, to to instruct um, these models. So it might be that even if GPT four is quite expensive, you can you can sort of uh, try to distill it into another model. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of like technological mode from OpenAI, I'm I'm not so. Um, it does seem like you know GPT four is here. These things only only get you here, but it's not. I don't. I don't see how it's gonna be equivalent. And when when you're talking about generalist um, artificial intelligence, um, the difference for many applications, not not all of them. For instance, we've been playing a lot, quite a lot with GPT four. Um, it's not that different to like when you when you first try to to chat GPT, but. Um, when you start doing more complex instructions, the difference between GPT-4 and ChatGPT or DaVinci um, become more clear. Um, so there's this kind of very funny um, tweet by uh, Jason Fang on like number of parameters by GPT-4 and number of Yama fine-tuned on chat data project on my on my feed. Um, I see Gabriel. Uh, not sure. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Um, uh, yeah, and finally, I think that's the last slide on the news. Well, almost. Uh, there's a couple of, of reports that were interesting. The state of competitive machine learning that looks at different sort of platforms that do um, a competitive machine learning, like Kaggle is the, is the is the main one. The title of like the prize money and all of that, and how how has that that has been evolving. And then um, perhaps uh, one of uh, important ones is the AI Index Annual Report from Stanford. Um, and I highlighted here a few of their main takeaways. They're not that surprising. It's it's more of a sort of like nicely packaged report. It's many like hundreds of pages. I'm not going to pretend that I've read it all, um, but I've skimmed through it. Um, and um, uh, um, yeah, uh, I think you know industry races ahead of academia is probably the the most important one or like a transition that has been happening, especially in the past couple of years. Um, and I think it's you know it's it's an in inevitable thing, um, and the two the t sort of academia and industry are gonna kind of have to learn to how to to coexist uh, in the research space. But I do think they're gonna be able to coexist because they have very different dif different uh, incentives. Um, yeah, the performance saturation on traditional benchmarks. It is you know uh, the benchmarking space is probably the most. Interesting space um, right now. Uh, well, that's that's a very opinionated statement, but I really like the the whole space of benchmarking because you know the moment all of these benchmarks are saturated, um, it becomes more important uh, to you know think of better ways to measure uh, machine learning models and all of this. Um, and yeah, they they make some points about like the the carbon footprint of AI and also how that's how that's. Uh, 
also helping um, with uh, um, um, sort of, for instance, there was there was, there was very interesting work um, uh, that looked at modeling sort of the infor- like modeling the sort of game theoretic interactions between countries when it comes to coordination problems about climate change and how um, AI could could uh, uh, uncover insights to. Um, um, you know, have better strategies to align countries on action plans for for climate change. Um, yeah, and finally, uh, I'm not. Uh, Yitai is one of uh, very prolific uh, researchers uh, from Google from the past three years. Um, he's published a lot of a lot of papers on language models. Um, and he recently announced uh, he was leaving Google Brain to to work on uh, to be I think it's the the, the co-founder and CTO on um, on a startup that is still unclear what what they're gonna do probably some some type of work around foundation models language models um, in that space. Um, that said. Uh, like uh, we don't have a lot of um, uh, you know this this past week uh, ECAR has been happening so the European Conference in Information Retrieval of course that's very close to our hearts um, and a, a team from Z Alpha has been there and Jakub is already there I really hope that maybe we, for the recorded version of this webinar on YouTube we'll have we'll have a bit of his collaboration on uh, as a, like a short video. Uh, but here you can see a voice, a voice viewer, a visualization of the of the content at the um, at the conference, and it seems like um, they've had a lot of fun uh, showcasing the 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 product uh, to the um, to the attendees of the of the conference. And that brings me to the commercial segment um, of this webinar, which is about us very very quickly. Uh, Z Alpha is a discovery prob- uh, platform focused on AI and data science content. Um, and we include a, a whole bunch of productivity uh, features like to search, organize your research, visualize large amounts of, of uh, documents, and all of these powered by um, neural net, well, neural search, uh, basically like transformers that um, you know make sense of documents and and allow uh, for better uh, for better search. Um, uh, we've recently integrated um, uh, GP, uh, uh, G, um, language models um, integrations for private data, so that uh, if you if you're a user, you can upload your private documents and answer questions based on those documents, uh, which is super useful. Um, yeah, and the platform is what I use pretty much uh, every month to collect this uh, collection of uh, interesting research. And here you see a visualization of the research from the from the past month, uh, where we use language models to label each one of the region, and it's super useful to get a kind of a good sense, uh, overall sense, and kind of like high level sense of uh, what is happening. For instance, at a conference or something like that. Um, so if you're a user, um, there's a, a, a global ch- um, tag where you can see the, the selection of, of papers that I do every month. Um, and yeah, uh, without further ado, let's jump into commenting on, on some of these uh, specific uh, papers and research. The first one, uh, sorry, let me get out. The, um, the first one, you know, it couldn't be any other way. So there's the... Uh, GPT-4 technical report. Well, I mean, first of all, calling this a paper is a, is a controversial uh, sort of label uh, because it's more of a, well, I mean, they call it technical report. It's, it's more like a PDF um, a blur on, ar- on archive, but it's more of a, you know, uh, PR-focused um, report. Um, and they really don't disclose anything about a model. We don't even know how many parameters it has, how many data they use for training, what is the sort of ar- high-level architecture. Are they using some sort of just a dense model, just some sort of mixer of experts? It's really, really unclear. My my bet would be that it's not much bigger than, than GPT-3. I feel like if it was much bigger than GPT-3, they would have said something, but that's pure speculation. Um, the other reason why I don't think it's much bigger than GPT-3 is because we've seen with the since the Chinchilla scaling loss paper that um, you can get a lot more value by just being more clever and training for longer, basically. So it seems like the parameter count is not was not the the bottleneck when it comes to to performance of GPT-3. So I would guess GPT-4 is below the trillion parameter. 
below the trillion parameters, which is would be like less than five times uh, GPT-3. Um, probably a bit bigger. Um, I don't know. It's just uh, uh, speculation at this point. But um, you know, given that there was not a lot of information on the GPT-4 technical report. Um, we also included these, you know, sparks of artificial general intelligence, early experiments with GPT-4, which is a sort of very long report uh, from a research group at Microsoft who had access to GPT-4 while it was under development. Um, and it's basically like a whole evaluation paper on, on looking at, I think that my favorite part about this paper is that it looks at a lot of just anecdotes and uh, examples of, of GPT-4 behavior. Uh, and not only focuses on the sort of benchmark uh, numbers. And I think that gives you a much better sense of what GPT-4 is, is sort of like a, like a, this quali more qualitative understanding of what GPT-4 can do. Um, of course, there's also like the numeric kind of evaluation and, and, and that's like very important also to, to focus on that. But um, yeah, like I think that the most hilarious uh, example that they have in evaluation is this that has has also become quite popular. Oops, sorry. Um, which is they ask you to draw a unicorn in Tix, which is this package to to draw stuff on LaTeX, um, and they say how like how it evolved during. So like they had access to this um, API for uh, a month or or a bit more, um, and they. Uh, you know, they they show how well of a unicorn GPT-4 is able to draw, and you can see how it improves. And uh, that makes me wonder: Did they include any sort of iteratively include some uh, training data based on what people were trying? Did did they kind of make the model more more proficient in ticks? Um, I think a lot of the another speculation that I would have about GPT-4 is that um, you know the large Scale pre-training is probably like a very uh, something that hasn't changed that much since GPT-3. They probably like run it for longer and they they're more clever about the data. But I feel like they probably have been um, also improving a lot on the idea of kind of iteratively adding um, capabilities to the model without being detrimental to the previous uh, model. So, for, for instance, maybe they had some you know LaTeX uh, specific data that they fine tuned um, after the 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 base pre-training, and they found ways to to sort of have some some maybe uh, um, I forgot the word now, but uh, basically some some sort of uh, you know training that a per, like. Makes the that helps the GPT-4 learn something new without for like doing this transfer learning basically without forgetting um, everything that it had previously learned. Uh, yeah, and b besides that, you know, code generation has been great, um, and and math has been also much better. Um, by playing by ear, with with played quite extensively uh, with it. Um, I would say like the main highlights is it doesn't it does it doesn't feel that much different to other models. Uh, once you start interacting with it, however, once you start giving it very complex instructions, it's remarkably good at following all of them. Um, but still, it makes a lot, it flops a lot when it comes to reasoning um, and like maths, and you know, it, it makes a lot of a lot of a lot of mistakes. But but it still makes a lot. Like, well, it certainly makes less than than it used to. Uh, but it's still like not uh, not trustworthy. But you know, I, I feel it's in, important to sort of highlight that that. It, it was never claimed that he was uh, very trustworthy. Um, okay, moving on to um, our second paper, uh, which is large language models doing context learning differently. Which uh, is it has a very in, like, small but uh, you know useful insight um, in the fact that large language models have some capabilities that smaller ones don't have. That that doesn't it's not a new thing. But the experiments they do is with label flipping. Um, uh, mainly, uh, which is this uh, concept of like what happens if you, let's say, if you want to do sentiment classification, and in your um, in your in your in context labels, instead of saying like you know like good reviews give it the positive labels, bad reviews give it a negative label, for instance, what if you switch uh, flip that? Like a human would be pretty quick to realize that you're just being asked to do um, sentiment classification with flip labels. Um, and the question here was how well would lang language models adapt to this and sort of override this semantic prior that, you know, positive sentences come before positive labels. Um, 
And uh, yeah, they basically find that small models are not uh, capable of doing these. They sort of become random once once their in context learning is incoherent with the with the sort of semantics of the stuff they have found in pre-training. Um, but large language models are able to do this flip. Um, and I think it it sort of it's a little bit evidence once again that these large language models learn some sort of um, higher level reasoning like capabilities where they are able to capture new new relationships and concepts much faster by just encountering them a couple of times in um in um in the in the in the prompt um i want to move on because we don't have that much time um so the next one the next paper that i wanted to highlight is uh it kind of like well comes in in this in this sort of um um, a family of papers that, that there's been three main ones that I've seen, um, and is this whole thing of embedding language models in some sort of self improvement or self refinement um, loop, and how much that improves performance. So one of the I think super interesting things that has happened in the past you know, two years or something is what well, or like was well, pretty much since GPT three was was announced and it, it started this whole prompting sort of paradigm. Um is people have realized that, you know, these language models are very powerful compute engines. Um but from the base they, they're hard to interact with and then they're wrong very often. But you can have clever ways to use this prompting paradigm to have better better performance. Like so examples are these, for instance, let's, let's think step by step paper where simply by adding something to the prompt, the model became so much better. Or the other very interesting uh, recent example is the chain of thought reasoning, right? If you make the model output a chain of thought, it becomes better at reasoning. So this is one of one of these uh, kind of advancements, which is, for instance, like I think that the human intuition is very easy to like to understand, right? We normally, when we try to solve a problem, we often don't get it right on the first try. But you, you know, you, you create some sort of reasoning path, um, and once you have unfolded that reasoning path, you sort of look at it again and say, okay, does this make sense still? And if it doesn't, you try again, learn like kind of applying what you have learned. Um, and you know, like vanilla language models by default don't have the ability to do that because they just generate token by token ultra aggressively and they just generate the answer once. But what if you answered what, what if you ask them to reflect on their answer and improve it if that's if that's necessary? Um, so basically uh, a bunch of um, um, that's something that these these, these people propose. Um, and it seems to improve uh, quite a bit on uh, you know reasoning performance and also alignment for tasks more like creative tasks like write a summary that does this or that. Um, and yeah, so there's this first one, like a reflection, which is kind of more focused on the planning aspect of like, you have a goal and you, you need to like do X, Y, Z, like you want to cook something, you, you need to do all these plans. And then you look back, you, you, you continuously iterate, um, on it until it's right. Uh, there's also this, you know, self refine is more focused on this more instruction alignment, like f making sure that language models follow instructions very clearly. For instance, imagine you have ChatGPT. We had this problem recently, um, and you want to make a summary of a document that is not more than uh, this amount of words, and is also like bullet points, and is also has this tone. It's very possible that it's gonna the ChatGPT is gonna generate a summary that uh, follows like only two of your requirements or your instructions. So may, uh, by asking it to sort of reconsider the the the, um, uh, the task and repeat it again, uh, the performance can can be improved. Um, and yeah, and finally, there's this also language model can solve computer tasks, which applies this to solving uh, generalist computer tasks. Um, um, and and sort of having this this uh, another way that they call this is this um, critique uh, fix um, no predict predict critique and fix I think uh, is the uh, maybe I'm getting it wrong now anyway that, but the whole idea is like generate something critique it and then try again until it's until it's right um, and I think that that's that's you know gonna you're gonna see all this you know like the performance that OpenAI sort of uh, and, and other language model providers, not only OpenAI, they, they sort of like the performance on the benchmarks that they showed, um, we're going to see probably that with these clever tricks, that performance can even improve 
uh, a lot, like we we saw with GPT-3, which was tremendously under optimized and tremendously, uh, you know, uh, you could you could get so much better performance by being clever about how you interact with it. Um, all right, staying on the foundation models, there's these. Uh, um, uh, I wanted to highlight foundation models for decision making, um, and there was this this sort of nice um, uh, survey paper that that kind of talks about the the big challenges and like what's been done until now. Um, and um, I mean, I I think that this sort of relates to another trend that we've been talking about uh, quite a lot, which is. Um, language like using language models as priors or like leveraging the all the knowledge like the knowledge is encoded there to um, be helpful in re in reinforcement learning situations where you have often a problem of very um, very um, exploration inefficient exploration right um, when you want to explore a state space um, and I think this is a really, really nice uh, survey that, that that ties a lot of a lot of those things together. Um, one of the maybe most interesting points I think that this survey makes is this problem of the the they call it data set gap, which is foundation models are trained in something that you you could cons you could um, conceptualize as offline learning or or like behavior cloning, where they just kind of predict the next uh, token, right? Even if if it if even if it's uh, in a kind of RL scenario where like you have agents and actions and uh, and rewards, you you just like predict auto aggressively action token, but the I, the agent doesn't have these RL pro online RL agent property of the agent interacts with the with the world, um, and they make the point that it's hard to have these models that are trained on on static data um, that is very diverse and very large. Uh, there's often like a gap um, when you try to apply them uh, for decision making, and then and then. Uh, you have problems of like how how well of a coverage you have of the state action space, um, and this is kind of a challenge that they highlight that that these models are are having. Uh, but certainly, I would say that uh, you know, foundation models and language models in reinforcement learning might be the thing that sort of revives the field from the from a lot of the foundational pitfalls that that were not fully, uh, you know, I would say were not completely solved, as in. What I just said about the how inefficient RL is, right? Um, so, so yeah, so 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 that's um, you know bringing some hope to 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 that space. Uh, and finally, just wanted to smallly hi uh, briefly highlight this baby AGI project, which is sort of just one implementation of this uh, agent that uses GPT-4 to interact with all these components of you know execution, task creation, uh, memory. Um, um, and I will like certainly. I mean, you know, we're certainly gonna see so many of these projects. It's, it's kind of very uh, overwhelming these days to just scroll a bit through Twitter or Reddit or, or places and see like the amount of projects that people have uh, created um, with with uh, with GPT-4 in just three weeks. It was literally released, uh, um, yeah, three weeks ago and two days. Actually, the on last in the last webinar, um, we. Uh, um, we joked with, with Jakub that there was this this rumor that the GPT-4 was going to be released in, uh, in the next week, and it, it and it turned out to be to be right. Um, all right, we just have ten minutes left, so real quick, the other paper uh, highlighted here uh, is the impact of GPT models on um, uh, on the job market. Uh, this, is of course, not a machine learning paper, but I think it was interesting to sort of contextualize the whole discussion that a lot of people have on like, oh, this is going to have such a big impact in jobs. Like, uh, this is going to automate so many jobs or no, this is going to be super good. Uh, you know, this is going to increase productivity and, and then suddenly like there's going to be a massive uh, growth in the economy. Uh, you know, this paper doesn't really answer that. It just looks at, it's interesting, it just looks at how much faster different tasks can be done with large language models. And you can see, for instance, basically a lot of the writing, a lot of the programming can be much faster. Um, but, you know, the, the, the question is still in the air of like, is that going to make just programmers or writers or like all other types of tasks uh, more productive and suddenly like a lot of more things are going to be happening and then it's going to have the same amount of people doing more and then you know the economy is going to uh, grow so much because of it or is it just going to be like a lot of jobs will disappear because a le le less people are needed um, you know only time uh, you know predicting the fu uh, making predictions is very hard especially if they are about the future um, but if you're interested in the in kind of trying to 
find out how how you know uh, language models and and this AI is gonna have an impact um, on the job market. Definitely check check uh, this paper. Um, all right, moving on to some uh, text to image generative stuff. Um, I wanted to highlight this paper, which is about uh, raising concepts from diffusion models. One of the things that I like to highlight about generative AI is that is sort of enabling this new way of inter of having humans interact with computers, right? Um, and I think that's that's sort of one of the big game changers of 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 what AI. Uh, lets us do, which is like we can have very high level and very much more abstract ways of interacting with computers, um, but there still very much needs to be that human in the loop. Um, um, anyway, this model uh, tries to look at how you can, um, you know, erase certain concepts or certain things from images using diffusion models. Um, and you know, they have examples here with uh, nudity or artistic style or uh, erasing objects. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's just gonna one one little bit in making these models, you know, more useful in the when you're editing images or on all of that side, of ma making this so much faster. And I mean, this has already been happening in Adobe and all of these uh, Creative Suite suite um, uh, comp uh, products integrating all this, all this, and this is just like a next step. Um, the other one uh, I want to highlight in the text in the kind of general image generative space, is this text to video. Again, this is not really video, this is more like GIFs. But the, the super cool part about this paper is that they train, uh, well, they train not, they produce a text to video model that doesn't need video to be trained. It's just basically a text to image model. Uh, and then they're clever about how they modify the embeddings of the image generated. So like the, not the embedding, the latent space, maybe I should say, the latent space of this uh, image generation. So they sort of, tweak that to create um, coherent movement. So sort of basically well, well, imagine you, when, when, you're, when, when you're doing latent diffusion, which means you're doing diffusion from a latent space, uh, not directly in pixel space, um, if you sort of jiggle that embedding in the latent space, you're gonna get outputs that are very close to like close to each other, but they're not gonna be temporarily coherent. So you're gonna just kind of like have some blurry, like not, not a coherent video. So they they um, come up with some clever tricks to make this move, this this sort of uh, transition be coherent, um, and then they get this sort of. I mean, you judge, you're, you're the judge yourself. They're not like amazing videos, but they're still somewhat coherent, cherry picked for sure. Um, uh, video uh, like gifts, so so uh, you know. I think that, that that's still pretty cool. You know, imagine if you have a, just um, an image and you can animate it um, without having to have any v video involved in the in the in the process. I think that's that's the, that's the main differentiator. Up until now, the text to video model that we had seen from Meta and others um, incorporated video in the training, uh, but this one doesn't. Um, all right. Uh, briefly talking about uh, neural radiance, neural radiance fields. This work, uh, LERF, language embedded radiance fields, um, incorporates uh, clip embeddings into the ra um, into neural radiance fields. For those who don't know, neural radiance fields are a method for rendering three D scenes that basically parameterize a three D scene with a neural network. So you just give it. Um, a neural network, uh, a, a, like a position, uh, like from which to render uh, a scene, and then you um, learn that scene, and then like by uh, by uh, training uh, this network on like many views of one scene, eventually you get sort of uh, some some smooth interpolation of how a scene looks from different angles, and you don't have to explicitly model you know things like the triangles and renderings and all of that. Um, so what they do is they incorporate clip embeddings from from those images into the training, and they generate some what they call is grounding of these 3D clip embeddings, what enables them to do some some of these heat maps you see here. Um, I thought this oh they should be moving outside. If you go to the project page, they have a very cool demo um, where you just tap on different things, and you can see how um, for different elements in a picture in a photo or like in, in this well it's not not really a photo it's like in this scene. Um, they they generate heat maps that correspond to some sort of semantic segmentation of the of the scene, uh, and that's really cool. And they also show how these three D um, basically they show how these 
uh, the addition of 3D um, allows them to have much more precise segmentation compared to if you were um, doing this with static images uh, in 2D. Uh, the last two, we have the uh, this paper from DeepMind is about how you can make RNNs uh, perform well on long sequences. You know, like famously, RNNs uh, are not really good at long sequences. That's also why, like, you know, they suffer from the vanishing gradients problem. LSTM sort of so solved that, but not really that well. That's why transformers are these days, uh, you know, like used everywhere. However, there's still, you know, some applications where uh, you want to use RNNs because they're much faster at inference, they're like linear um, uh, in complexity completely. Uh, and they just apply a bunch of tricks and they show that um, you can have on par performance with something called the S4, which is a deep state space model, which we talked about, I think, maybe a year ago or something like that. Um, it basically, I just wanted to highlight it because it's it just sort of like reinforces this trend of like, um, there's probably not so much in the specific clever architecture of something, if you're like really good at how you implement it and you kind of have the right skip connections and like all of these, you can probably have uh, many different architectures perform on par. Um, and yeah, so if you're into RNNs, um, and, uh, definitely check out this paper. And finally, um, I don't know if you remember, we've commented on a paper called the Differentiable Search Index, which is a sort of a new paradigm for doing information retrieval, in which instead of doing uh, retrieving from an index with keywords or retrieving from nearest neighbor or doing re-ranking with transformers, you basically input a query into a, um, a language model, and the language model is tasked to produce a document ID as the output, like literally, you know, like a, a label that is a, a, the ID of a document. And this is a very kind of break, like a paradigm that, that's very different, has a lot of problems. That, um, anyway, um, the idea of this paper is to apply that same idea into the recommender system space. So basically you have, um, uh, they, they cast the problem of recommendation into a sequence problem where a model learns kind of like auto aggressively, like oh the you know the user like this item, this item, this item, and then um, the model generates recommendation by simply auto aggressively generating a next item, um, and they have a very good performance on the product uh, on the Amazon product reviews dataset. Um, and I think this is very interesting, this, this whole emerging space of generative information retrieval. We're actually going to have a podcast uh, very soon um, about that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's kind of unclear what, what sort of impact that's going to that's gonna have, but there's certainly something happening in the space of, of information retrieval and using the, the generative ideas, generative AI ideas, I would say, in, in the space of information retrieval. Uh, and that closes our selection of, of 10 um, uh, papers. Uh, before we close it, I wanted to have a couple uh, you know, more, more fun remarks. Uh, there's this Twitter user um, who has found uh, a way to compress uh, the output of, of, uh, of GPT-4 sites that it can be decompressed by someone else. Um, basically, the idea is you, you, you task GPT-4 to generate a sequence of characters or tokens that are a good comp a lossless compression of a text. And then someone else, somewhere uh, like without any other context, just copy pastes that sequence into, into the model and then the model decodes it into the, the full original text. Uh, it doesn't work perfectly, but I think this also highlights the capabilities of this model in, the, in, the, in compression, which of course, you know, from an information theoretic point of view, makes a lot of sense that uh, these models are, are sort of minimizing the, uh, are simply in a way, you can conceptualize them as just minimizing the surprise they see in each token, so they're gonna be, become very good compressors of, of text. Um, and um, yeah, and last the last the last sort of uh, little joke, um, AK, which is this um, sort of very famous uh, Twitter account that posts interesting papers, uh, says we should probably have a six day uh, pause in AI research so um, they can take a a, a day off. Um, and with that, uh, I'm gonna close this edition of the um, uh, Trends in AI. Uh, thank you for everyone for 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 joining us. The next edition we still have to um, uh, pin down the exact date, but we're gonna center it around iClear 2023, which is coming on the first week of May. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for your attention, and I'll see you everyone in um, 
uh, in the next edition.